So hello everyone, uh, Tom Melvin is my name um, and I'll be your um, host for uh, today's webinar. Um, today we're going to talk about the monitoring of the life cycle of an implant in real life, which is part of the CoreMD project, which is a Horizon uh, funded European project under coordination of research and evidence for medical devices. I have a couple of slides just to help to tee up the discussion today. Um, this is the 11th webinar in the series from CoreMD. Uh, listed here on the screen, you can see the titles of the previous 10 webinars. Um, all of these webinars are um, uh, maintained on the CoreMD webpage. Um, we have two more webinars yet to come in the CoreMD project. You can see on the 4th of March, we'll have a discussion with uh, Ola Rolfson and John Chaplin, um, who are from uh, the CoreMD project, and they've been doing some work on PROMS. Um, so they'll present some of the findings at that webinar. And then we have our final webinar on the 25th of March, where we'll discuss uh, the notified body role and conformity assessment process. Um, to find all of the previous webinars, as well as a recording of this webinar, you can go to the CoreMD webpage, and you can also see the QR code that will bring you directly there, core-md.eu. And I guess it's also important to note that there will be a final event for the CoreMD project. CoreMD started in April of 2021 and will finish at the end of March this year. Uh, for the final public event, uh, the title of it is, as you can see on the screen here, uh, Developing Methodological Approaches for Improved Clinical Investigation and Evaluation of High-Risk Medical Devices. Um, so at that final event, we look at the current state of implementation of the EU Medical Device Regulation will present results of the core MD project, will consider how clinical experts should contribute to the regulatory system, and will reflect on what developments and reforms might be needed. Um, that uh, in-person uh, event will also be a hybrid one, so you'll be able to dial in online. But if you're either intending in-person or online, you need to register in advance. Um, again, you can find uh, links to that through the page here or through this QR code. Um, and the event will be on the 15th of March, uh, and in person it will be held in the, the Varende Club in Brussels. So I guess to introduce today's webinar and what we'll be talking through, uh, first up we'll have Richard Holbro. Um, Richard works um, with the BSI Notified Body, he's Head of Global Clinical Compliance, and Rich will talk about the use of real-world data for approval of medical devices with a particular focus on conditional certification. After that, we'll have a discussion with Professor Rob Nellison. Um, Rob will talk about selecting an implant from an orthopedic surgeon's perspective. Um, following that, we'll have a presentation from Dr. Perla Morang van den Meen, who's going to talk about assessing the performance and safety of medical devices using registry data. And then we'll have an update from Dr. Joshua Bridgens, who'll bring a manufacturer's perspective and will talk about the needs and challenges pertaining to registry data. Uh, following that, we'll have time for questions and answers. Questions can be placed using the chat bar, um, and they can be placed either anonymously or with your name. Uh, we may have time for one or two burning questions between presentations, or otherwise we'll maintain the Q&As towards the end. If there's any technical questions or general questions, we'll of course try to deal with them in the chat bar. Um, so I guess a couple of the other housekeeping rules. Um, so I guess for you as participants watching this webinar, it's in lecture mode. So I guess the questions go in the, in the type method that we mentioned. Um, and I guess if you're interested in CoreMD, um, it's also possible to uh, subscribe to the regular newsletter and also to follow CoreMD uh, on the social media channels. Um, so without any further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Richard Holbro. Um, I'll take the screen sharing down and hand over to Rich. And thank you very much for joining, Rich. That's great. Thanks, Tom. Um, hopefully you can just confirm that you can see my slides. Is that correct? It works. Yeah, That's fantastic. Great. That's great. Okay. Yeah. Thank, thank you for inviting me along to talk about the Notified Bodies perspective on, on real world data. And then I'll talk a little bit about conditional certification as well today. So where to start? I guess when you look at the definition of clinical data in the MDR, we now see this emphasis on actual data coming from the post-market period. I think post-market data is, is essentially real-world evidence in, in terms of clarifying the device's safety and performance. 
when when released onto the market. So the definition of clinical data under the regulation does now allow for the use of data for real world evidence. And it's fair to say, as we go through this transition in the regulation, we are seeing more and more devices, particularly legacy devices that have been on the market under the old system, the directives using uh, real world evidence to support their conformity assessment under the new regulation. So the the emphasis as well around um, real world data particularly comes out when the requirements for post-market clinical follow-up uh, are to be placed onto a device. So in the regulation, there is some specific requirements around the, the use or collection of data in the post-market period. And particularly so, they, they ask that the, the manufacturer particularly collects data over the lifetime of the device. And that's really to identify any sort of emerging risks that might occur. And what we see in, in uses or, or methods of post-market clinical follow-up, uh, we expect manufacturers to have a plan and they can, uh, in that plan, have general or specific methods. The general methods tend to be what I would consider passive ways of collecting data. So your complaints, your vigilance and the things that the manufacturer has to do, such as screening of scientific literature to look out for any uh, reported adverse events that, may, that the manufacturer may not be aware of. And then where it gets more interesting in terms of a proactive approach are the specific methods, okay? So those are where, where a manufacturer is proactively out there collecting data on their device under evaluation. Um, and those uh, within the plan can include uh, such as evaluation of suitable registers or actual post-market studies themselves. And really the manufacturer, a lot of people miss this uh, when they come to, to defining their activities in the post-market clinical follow-up plan, but really to give the rationale for what they think are appropriate methods to, to be out there collecting data. Of course, as I said, we are, you know, there is a, an expectation that manufacturers collect data through the expected lifetime of the device. And unfortunately, the regulation doesn't define for us what, what lifetime is. Um, but it's important that 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 is considered because the lifetime of a device can be interpreted many ways, and we'll talk about that through some examples that I have on slides. But Team MB produced a position paper uh, last month, oh sorry, in December 2023, um, just at the end of last year, about their thoughts on on what clarifies as as lifetime, and why is this important? Because Really, the definition of lifetime will depend on the device. A disposable item, for example, might be used for 20, 30 minutes during a surgical procedure and then disposed of and never used again, whereas an implantable device may be in the patient for the remainder of their life. But does it necessarily mean it's going to be therapeutic for the remainder of that life? Because we know that there could be expectations or examples where that, that's not the case. So the expectation is that the manufacturer under Article 83, the post-market surveillance plan, that for every type of device that they have, they need to have a specific post-market surveillance plan that is proportionate to the risk class and appropriate for the type of device. So on the previous screen, when we saw those specific activities, you can expect that higher class devices, so your class threes and implantable devices, will typically have specific methods for post-market clinical follow-up. So those are the those are the types of devices where we would see um, the collection or data being used, uh, collected in registries or, or specific post-market studies. So I think as a notified body or as a group of notified bodies, uh, we, you know, we've often talked about the uses of real world data and often it's very good at identifying um, the true use of a device by in considering inclusive data. We know that a lot of pre-market studies, for example, will have strict pre-market criteria. Um, may make patients ineligible to, to go into a study if they've had previous therapies, et cetera. But the reality is we know when a device is out there, it's more widely to be used and the patient pathway before receiving the device will be very different to what is in a study, for example. We know that 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 uh, real world data can be, you know, effective. Clinical trials are expensive, but retrospective post market data collection, for example, can, can be quite uh, beneficial and, and have some significant cost savings. And we know that generally there is accepted ethical, um, sorry, ethical acceptance for, for established devices that are already on the market to continue uh, enrolling into registries and collecting data and using that data, particularly for purposes of conformity assessment. And retrospective data often, often generally involves a minimal healthcare professional input as well. Particularly when there are, when we're seeing a lot of legacy devices uh, being, or certainly patient data being extracted from clinical records to support conformity assessment. There are some negatives, of course, that uh, observational data is typically open to, to greater bias, and there is often limited intervention of the data source there, and often there's um, an inability to, to have an interventional study. 
Data entry may lack detail outside of the controlled environment. Again, um, yeah, that's a real concern that, that when we look at real world data. And typically data is often focused on safety rather than performance. I think that's truly reflective of some of the methods that we see in the real world uh, data spaces that actually the data that is there is looking perhaps at adverse events rather than thinking about the bigger picture of performance and the longevity of that performance in itself. And again, a long example of a Conry stent. Now a Conry stent might be um, implanted permanently. Um, however, um, the actual therapeutic phase of a coronary stent may only be typically five to eight years, but a patient will have a stent put in them and, and that will stay within the body uh, for, for the lifetime of that patient. And that, you know, if patients have a stent as young as 40, 50 years of age, that could be several decades um, until the patient dies that, that the stent remains with them. So we need to be sure that when we look at the examples of capturing real world data, that that really that the or the methods that are used are trying to catch the highest risks associated with the device. And in a coronary stent, for example, stent thrombosis is quite typical within the first few months of implant or the risk of stent thrombosis. And again, we need real world data uh, that, that can cap capture that event. We would typically, uh, the, the reason you see the red bar here is because typically we would base our, our, our judgment on two years of data before releasing a device into the market with the expectation that manufacturers then commit to post-market studies. And really that's to capture the longer stage uh, of risks, shall we say. So for example, restenosis in a stent in terms of performance. So again, there's some concerns there that, that we need to capture. And this presents a little bit of a, 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 a I guess, a situation for notified bodies because you know, we, we aren't going to wait six, seven years for clinical studies in order to release devices because technology might have moved on by then. So there has to be some guarantee. And that's why in the post-market phase in particular, we're looking for um, particularly um, uh, longer term studies to cover the lifetime of the devices we heard out called out in the requirement. Um, so in these examples, large volume national databases capture information at time of implant and re-intervention. What we do find, though, sometimes is that during that, life, that lifetime of that stent, patients may have increase in angina symptoms that might be managed by their family practitioner. But of course, that entry or that information might not be absorbed into a, into a registry where the registry is used at time of implant or time of re-implant, for example. The good thing about these, these particular registries is they do think about stratifying the data to device type, and that's really helpful for us as a notified body. Also stratifying to indications, uh, anatomical locations, because we know that there are certain higher risks anatomically with the coronary stent, for example, in the left main versus maybe um, somewhere like the mid right coronary artery. So th there has to be some way of looking for us as a notified body to prove that the device is truly reflective in indications and anatomical location as well. Often there's able to, when, once that registry, large pool of registry data is there, again, it enables manufacturers to have that large retrospective analysis. And often the entry, data entry is done by medical professionals. One of the downsides of, 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 of what we'd often see as notified bodies is actually these devices are, are used with other high risk accessories. So for example, coronary balloons might be used to dilate the coronary artery at the start of a procedure, or maybe used with guide wires that can sometimes cause dissection. And often during cardiac procedures, the most troublesome issue is the guide wire that often causes problems. So again, registries don't tend to capture that, although you can make an indirect reference to the fact that if it's been a successful descent deployment, you can assume that accessories are there. But really the definition of clinical data in, under the regulation requires us to look at the device under evaluation and that can prove a challenge for us as a as a notified body and again data is typically heavy on safety rather than clinical performance and and really the mdr calls out the interpretation of clinical benefits as something that is meaningful and measurable to patients and that's something we're always looking for as notified bodies this is quite an interesting one you know now we've got a, a breast implant for example and that's a, a potentially removable implant. Um, and we have a therapeutic phase, which is probably the lifetime of the patient. You know, it will be used throughout the lifetime. And that lifetime of that patient could, you know, if somebody as young as, as 30, 40 years of age is having a, a breast implant, they could be living up to 70, 80. So you, there are potential concerns about how do we capture that data in the long term. So whilst at the start of this medical procedure, there might be some standard surgical risks, and then we might release a, a device after two years of data, there are some concerns, particularly emerging with breast implants around long-term uh, anaplastic large cell lymphoma, which we're starting to see correlate or starting to see evidence of um, or suggestion of. 
and really in these um uh, in this example um the registries are, are really good a, a good way of looking at some practical methods um, in terms of following up residual risks with long-term implants and can also form the identification for purposes of recalls. And we've seen some of that with the PIP implant scandal, for example, where we needed to recall um, patients uh, for um, removal of their breast implants. Interestingly, the FDA has a very strict requirement with breast implants and calls out that 80% of patients need to be enrolled into a registry and the manufacturer needs to be proactive in ensuring that happens. But of course, breast implantation, for example, might be considered medical tourism in some areas. Some people might travel to private cosmetic clinics where there is not participation in registries, for example, or patients may move to different countries to get implants because of um, either they're not available in their local care system, or in fact, there, there is a price associated with, with traveling that, that is beneficial to the patient. Um, again, stratification of data here in this particular example has been able to help uh, the, the notified body community and the, the medical community to identify and stratify certain types of breast implants that might be at higher risk of a ALCL. And then uh, last but not least, as part of my presentation today, I'm going to talk a little bit about conditional certification. Uh, historically, under the directives, there was no real requirement for, for notified bodies to consider issuing certificates uh, with conditions. Uh, but here under the regulation in Annex 7, which is the requirements to be met by notified bodies, there's now a, a actual section that, that talks about the need for, for certification uh, released under, under conditions. And really, that is about looking at devices where there is a, a need to maybe look at closer uh, impact in terms of health and safety of, of patients in the longer term um, and where there may be some areas where we need to monitor closely in the post-market period as a notified body. And the new regulation calls out that specifically, talking about specific milestones in which we may need to have guarantees from the manufacturer that they, in fact, are, are collecting that data. And that could be through studies, through registries or other activities that, that are appropriate to the device under evaluation. So when have we sort of when do we tend to think about conditional certification? Well, manufacturers now, as the MDR has got got much tighter and stronger on post market requirements, and I think it's fair to say that as uh, the MDR itself, you know, it can, it can be criticised for many reasons, but what it can't be criticised for is the increase in post market surveillance. I think that's really important, and what we tend to see is manufacturers have the obligation of doing. PMCF activities for standard devices, but occasionally we may need to release a device with, with limited data. And that could, for example, be where there's innovative um, products with high risk novelty, maybe orphan devices where there's actually inability to collect evidence um, in the pre-market phase, but there's clear evidence that they're supportive and beneficial to certain rare diseases, for example, or unmet medical needs where there may be a change in the, in the treatment of a of a particular condition, and there's showing good hope that that, that can be beneficial. Um, so there's a real um, drive, certainly under the regulation, to look more towards conditional certification. I think it's fair to say for us as notified bodies, conditional certification is not a substitute where manufacturers not been able to collect data on a on a standard device. Um, and it calls out specifically in Article 61.1 that a manufacturer needs to have sufficient evidence for their device under evaluation. We tend to use conditional certification uh, when there is a limitation to, to be able to collect sufficient data in the pre-market space, where there's a high level of novelty associated with unknown long-term risks and breakthrough products to support an unmet medical need. So really conditional certification for us as notified bodies is an exception to the rule, um, but it's there to, to help ensure that, that European patients get the get safe medical devices with a controlled market release. Um, just to conclude, really, I think I've covered these points, but you know, registry should be designed in an appropriate proportionate way to the technology and the typical patient pathway. And performance is a critical indicator and should not be overlooked when thinking about real world evidence collection. And a registry should be designed to capture risk through the lifetime of the device with opportunity for input from all healthcare personnel and professionals involved in the patient pathway. Registry should be designed to consider residual risks. We don't know what we don't know. And that's such an important statement because there are always things that come to surprise us in the long-term collection, uh, long-term behavior of devices. And independent data analysis is key to reduce bias as much as possible. And stratification of data is always important in real world evidence cases. And it's important that manufacturers have access to this data to ensure that uh, CE marking can continue and those, those, that data can be used for future conformity assessments. 
And finally, conditional certification remains an option for notified bodies to support innovation, orphan devices, or an unmet medical need. Thank you. Um, thank you, Rich. It, that was really great to get a notified body perspective on the use of real-world data. Um, if we have time for just one question, we have one from a member of the audience. Um, they ask in terms of, I guess, uh, the notified body perspective on gaps with available data. Um, so they mention an example where you might have a sample population that may not include a high number of female participants or may have gaps with respect to age ranges or things like that. So the question that the person is asking is, would the device be rejected or would there be some room in the post-market uh, for post-market follow-up uh, and that kind of thing? And maybe just before I hand over, uh, I'd just point out for legacy devices, at least MDCG 2020-6 um, would have the hierarchy and some references to, I think, what it calls methodological flaws with some studies. So there is guidance for shortcomings for legacy devices, at least, but it would be great to hear your notified body perspective, Rich, on, on that kind of topic. Yeah, I think I think it's fair to say in a short answer, yes, that is something that, that falls into post-market clinical follow-up, particularly in the case of legacy devices. I think the question we always have is how big is that gap, you know, and, and that, that's always a, a case-by-case uh, example. But generally, in an example that you've just provided, we would would still accept that with the allowance that, that data is collected. And I think that really is truly the purpose of PMCF is to, you know, identify residual risk through the lifetime of the device, but also to look at the gaps where, you know, you can design a pre-market clinical trial uh, as best as you possibly can, but there will always be downfalls in that trial design that that you know you you will realise later on. And so PMCF is all about trying to plug the gaps and and to build your set of data to really prove that your device is effective for all patient populations. For example, thank you, Rich. Um, I might move on to the next presentation if that's okay. So up next we have Professor Rob Nelson. Um, Rob is a professor of orthopedic surgery with uh, the Leiden University Medical Center. And uh, Rob also does work as the chair of EFORT, the European Federation of Orthopedics and Traumatology. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Rob and you can see the presentation here is selecting an implant from an orthopedic surgeon's perspective. Um, so thank you, Rob. Okay, thank you, Tom. So from uh, cardiovascular and breast to orthopedic uh, way of uh, thinking, I'd like to take you along the way we as orthopedic surgeons uh, try to think uh, for the best of our patients. Um, so first, when we have a patient in, in our outdoor clinic, we think, what, what is the problem? I think that's a very important part is, what's the indication? And then the indication will lead to a certain uh, choice of, of, an, of an implant. Well, the indication, well, when we take, for example, a patient with, with knee complaints, he may, he may have osteoarthritis, and then he may put a total knee in. Well, the reason to put it in is, is seems to be obvious, but you can see that the, the first green bars, the first five green bars, all are related to subjective measures from a patient's point of view. So you may have bare bone on bare bone, while patients are still walking in the mountains, while having little osteoarthritis of the knee, and this patient have, has severe pain. And you see the, 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 the no-brainers, the not reason for doing surgery is, in general, high, high age, young, young, young age, uh, low of comorbidity. These are just reasons not to do, to do surgery. So the indication to do surgery is a major driver to, to, to put a total knee in, hip, shoulder, etc. So the choice of the implants coming to this, we have several implants around, and of course, when you have a knee problem, you will not put a shoulder implant in, but you have a knee, a knee implant. But when you use these implants, it's very important to notice as a non-surgeon, this is for one patient, one total knee for one patient. And these stocks of instrumentation are used for one total knee. And that's not including the saw, the pinch, the, the, the pin set, and all these other devices which you need. So you can see, Doing this is not that you do every day a different total knee. And that's the reason that you, uh, most hospitals, they have usually a tender to do this total knee or total hip or total shoulder for a certain uh, period of time. Because it ha has to be a stock in that hospital for the hips and knees uh, and instrumentation. And also the OR nurses, the operating uh, nurses, she or he has to be trained to do this specific knee, hip, etc. And you can also imagine when you have these different different um, instrumentations with, with saw blocks, etc., 
You can also imagine that that surgeon will also have a learning curve when he has the the, the total knee of, of Birmingham and next year we use the, the, the Leiden total knee, then he or she, despite the fact he has done 2000, the basic principles are the same, but the way how to use the instrumentation will be different. And you can also imagine then when you put the total knee in, the implants, that will have also effect on the results. So it's very important to, to consider the whole construct. While in different devices, it's not related to the surgical technique. So when you consider also the different patients, you can all different patients, and all the different patients will have different, different sizes of their knee. Very interesting study, about a thousand knees, scans, Caucasians, Asians, Af Africans. You can see already by this, this picture that, are, that we have probably have eight billion different knees around in this, this world. And of course, in your operating room, you have all, only this limited stock of seven sizes. So adapting these sizes to that specific patient is already rather complicated. Despite the fact we put about two and a half to three million knees in, and about three to four million uh, hips in worldwide. Well, so you have a huge stock of the, the different knees to accommodate that specific patient with a artificial joint. You can also imagine when you have all these different sizes, which I showed you, different anthropomorphic sizes, it will also be a compromise to nature. And that's need, you need the surgical skills. So the surgeon thinks, okay, which implant do I have to use to accommodate my patient with a certain knee problem or hip problem or shoulder problem, whatever problem with a joint? He thinks, of course, about the benefit for his patient and the risk. So when you have a bone tumor patient, you accept more risk than for elective painful knee or shoulder because that patient will survive his painful knee, hip, shoulder, or spine, uh, a spinal problem. While at bone tumor patients, the five-year survival is still around 40%, so you accept more risk. So in general, that's a basic principle, which also comes back to the uh, benefit risk in the MDR. That's nice. That's how we clinicians think. Well, this is an example of the 250 uh, knees, 250,000 knees, which were done in the Netherlands. You can see the whole list in the Netherlands, we have about uh, 50 different knee implants on the market. So you can just pick what's it, the, 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 the three, the 13 year survival, five year survival, and then you pick your knee. And then you can say, well, you can make an op you can make an objective choice on the knee you're going to use in your average patient. But you can also see that's an article we did co comparing Caucasians, Dutch patients with Indonesian patients. You see the 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 um, uh, the Vertical bars are the different brands. We had nine different brands. And you can see there is a mismatch between the brands and the populations we have. So not every knee device or brand fits on Asian patients as well as on Caucasian patients. Just to show you all already the dilemma we as surgeons have when you have a certain type of patients in front of your, in, 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 the, uh, in, in your office. So you can imagine that the, the hips and knees or shoulder, et cetera, there's a very close relationship between the knees you put in and that patient. So it's adapted too. And we look at, at results from registries that are Dutch, but it's the same in the UK and, and, and Australia and, 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 and the Scandinavian countries. We, we, they, they have already very nice registries with 99% completeness. You see that the hip and the knee are performing uh, excellent. They have a 13-year uh, revision rate of 4%. So 96% is still in the body without any revision. That's excellent. And we see the finger and wrist and elbow have worse results. You also see that over the years, when you compare 2009 with 2020, there's a 0.5% increase of the survival. So less revision. So there's improvement thanks to implants, but also to, uh, thanks to improvement of surgical technique, even in this millennium. Let it be compared with 40 years ago. That's very nice that we have these improvements. But coming back to the first slide I showed you, but now more in detail, you see that the worst performing, 15% revision, compared to the best performing, 3.6. So the worst performing has about four times higher revision rates than the best performing total knee. In hindsight, you may say, but still, we're still exposed with that mediocre knee 
3,000 Dutch patients with a revision rate which is four times higher than the best performing, in hindsight. So it was a wrong choice of that specific orthopedic surgeon. The same is true for hips. You see 2.7, 2.1, the best X. There's also about four times higher revision rates for the worst performing total hip in the Netherlands compared to the best performing. And the same data can be also extrapolated to the, the UK, Australia, Scandinavia. That's so in hindsight, that, that's that's very important. So perhaps surgeons they need well, they had they need some eyeglasses to have a better vision of what's the best implant for their patients. Of course, because all these data are around. So it's not about picking something from the market. It's actually the, the choice for the average patient should be based on past performance. That's essential. And when you have new implants, you need implant migration analysis. That's, of course, my hobby, you know, RSA or CT measurements, which are predicted for long term. So past performance for the average orthopedic surgeon should be the way to go forward. That's also used by, by ODEP, for example, in the UK. The complicated thing is when you have your, your choice, an orthopedic implant is not only the orthopedic surgeon, it's also the EU tender, which is mandatory in the EU countries and probably also in the UK. And it's probably also valid in, in the US. So then the tender tends to have to have different criteria, not only looking at, at quality. And then if you have the private uh, focus clinics where private equity is coming in. So it makes that, 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 that choice very complex. And there are some very interesting articles out that money is a big driver. We an article in Yama four weeks ago, six, five weeks ago in Yama, where they analyzed um, 4.2 million uh, hospitalization in, 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 uh, in 260 hospitals in the US, compared them with almost 7,500 private equity hospitals. And we saw that the revision rate of the, in these private equity hospitals was higher. The same happens in the Netherlands. The choice in the focus clinics is sometimes different than the choice of an implant, which is used in a different hospital setting. It may be based on thing that's so that makes it rather complex. So to sum it up, indication, that's a medical complexity. It's not only the osteoarthritis, it's involving the whole participation of that implant of, of that patient in society, how he or she reacts, what's the comorbidity. That's already very, very complex. But making the choice, choosing the, the, the implants is sometimes more based on economics and logistic complexity. It should be based on evidence-based. In the end, that's the goal. But it makes it very difficult, complex, what is the best implant? And these seem to be opposing uh, things, e economics and logistics, first evidence-based, but actually it's, it's the same. Because when the implant is wrong, it costs a lot of money. So it should be a handshake. That's the different entities, but they should work together. In the end, it's for me as a surgeon, I should base my decision on evidence and surgical skills, but also for the industry and notified bodies, they should also make their decision, of course, on evidence. In the end, that's the, the way forward. And for me as a surgeon, I think in, in the end, it's uh, am I the best surgeon for with this implant, instrumentation, and my team for this specific patient? And I think... It, it was very nice to work in this consortium for CoreMD, and I would like to urge you all to visit our all old website, uh, all of our former webinars, which were excellent to give you some extra background information on the way we, we try to improve the world. Thank you, Tom. Um, uh, thank you, Rob. Uh, that was fantastic and, and great to hear the, the surgeon's perspective. Um, I, I might move on to the next presentation if that's okay and hopefully we'll have time for for questions and answers um after that um if it's okay i will turn next to dr perla morang van den Meen. Uh, perla is associate professor of quality and safety of care in the delft university of technology and perla is going to talk to us about assessing the performance and safety of medical devices using registry data um, and explaining some of the research findings uh, from core md activity so i'll hand over to you perla and thank you you may be on yes oh, i noticed sorry about that i needed to unmute can you confirm that you see my slides okay yes okay thank you um 
they Yes, they work. As already explained by Rich, the medical device regulation requires continuous monitoring uh, of both the performance and safety of medical devices after they are being CRE marked, so during the post-market surveillance phase. And real-world data, particularly registries, for instance, may provide ins uh, insights on how they perform, uh, as well as their safety in daily clinical practice, because uh, they include unselected uh, population-based data, where data, whereas clinical trials trials may include, for instance, uh, selected a selection of patients. And typically, they allow us uh, across a longer follow-up duration um, to really assess the safety and performance, and thereby also enable us to capture the non-frequently occurring adverse events that may have not appeared in clinical trials. So the key question that we tried to answer as part of our task during the CoreMD project was how can we uh, real world data and particularly registries supplement the evidence from these uh, randomized controlled trials? And there are different types of real world data. For instance, there are electronic health records and administrative data that are routinely collected in our hospitals. But the question is whether they would fit, like what, what definition is used, and do we have all the data available that we need to answer a particular regulatory question? Um, on the other hand, there are patient-generated data, uh, which may add uh, relevant other outcomes compared to clinical outcomes. But as we all know, it may be challenging to get sufficient uh, response rate and that limits the generalizability of these type of data. There are also data of the incident reporting type, I would say. And, and we know from this type of data that particularly if it's, concern, if it's voluntary uh, reporting, then the reporting behavior affected by culture in an organization has a huge influence on how much there is reported and that in many cases, it does not really reflect the underlying epidemiology of, uh, for instance, a safety issue. So in that context, safety notices, which are mandatory, uh, could uh, provide us with some insights, but still they only will give us the numerator, the number of safety concerns, uh, and not like how many patients there are at risk. So that's why we felt that registries would be a very valuable data source because they capture both numerator and denominator. So what constitutes a registry? Or oh, very briefly, we use the IMDRF definition that emphasizes that a registry should comprehensively cover the population at risk at a reasonably generalizable scale. And they add that it could be a region or a, a nation, etc. Also relevant to note is that there are, have been previous uh, regulatory uh, considerations for real-world evidence, for instance, uh, by the FDA, uh, where they emphasize data quality, validity, and transparency of data, and also mention two key factors to assess real-world data. On the one hand, relevance of the data, for instance, do they capture the necessary data elements, uh, and is it a representative study population, and on the other hand, reliability. So do we have procedures in place uh, to ensure data quality? So in that context, as part of the CoreMD project, we reviewed uh, 20 cardiovascular registries and on the left side and 26 orthopedic registry on the right side on 33 methodological and structural items uh, that uh, we felt, uh, informed by literature and expert advice, would be influencing the quality of the collected registry data and thereby the evidence that, the, that registries can provide. And this is work uh, done by Lotje Hoge first, first, which is published in the International Journal of Health Policy and Management, where you can find more detail. And what you see on this slide is that registries on the left uh, side of the, uh, the graph typically report things that have to do with identification, like the type of registry, whether a national or a regional registry. But they uh, do not report, at least not all of them report, on items related to governance, uh, indicated here in green, and even less so on data quality, completeness, and safety and performance. 
to give you a little bit more uh, insight in uh, the items underlying these uh, uh, graphs, uh, I've put some examples on this slide. For instance, for the cardiovascular registries, they tend not to report the patient level completeness. So do we have all the patients uh, included in that registries that have an implant, uh, uh, received such an implant? On the other so side, you see that orthopedic registries, at least the majority of them, do report that, but also that the completeness tends to vary from 20% to almost 100%. Hospital level coverage um, is reported by about the third of the uh, registries. Uh, about half of the registries mention procedures to check for data quality, uh, but only few um, report on how they deal with missing data. So from the, this, you can see that it seems uh, that agreement on items that all registries would report would be very good to allow regulators to really judge the regulatory utility of the data provided by registries and the quality of the ev evidence. And if they would know uh, like these types of variables, like for instance, the completeness, that might also increase the confidence that they have in the quality of this type of evidence. We also found, reviewing the registries, large heterogeneity in the reported outcomes and their definitions. For instance, on the left, the cardiovascular, 90% of them reported on mortality, but with on a lot of different time points. And the same for MACE, major cardiovascular events, where there were up to 17 different combinations of included complications in that composite outcome measure. And a similar picture emerged for the orthopedic registries, where revision for any cause was reported by most of the registries, but again, at a lot of different uh, time points. So from this, we took that uh, agreeing, uh, agreeing on a common data set, or perhaps a small data set of endpoints that would be collected by all of these registries, or at least using the same definition, would be very important to allow us to combine data, pull data, so that we could, with this larger set of data, detect any safety concerns much earlier. So when it comes to methods to evaluate the performance of medical devices within a registry, uh, you can, of course, use different designs and different methods, such as a randomized controlled trial or pseudo-randomization techniques, but also benchmarking implants and Rob already alluded to that uh, a little, um, because many of the orthopedic registries have uh, procedures in place to routinely identify implants that have an outlier performance. In this case, a significantly higher revision risk uh, than comparable other implants. And the ODAP, the, uh, the Orthopedic Data Evaluation Panel, uh, they assign a rating to implants, to orthopedic implants, based on a maximum uh, revision risk. So you only get the rating if you give, the, if you uh, show them evidence uh, about that that particular revision risk. But we could also look across different real-world data sources. For instance, we could look across different. Uh, we could follow the performance of the same uh, device across different registries or countries. Uh, and that might point us to other factors uh, inf also influencing performance. For instance, if we see variable performance, then it might well be that there are other factors influencing that performance besides the device itself. We could also look at other types of data, for instance, safety notices and the extent to which they signal the same implant uh, or perhaps uh, provide us with additional uh, uh, safety concerns, because not all of the safety concerns need to theoretically be uh, 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 resulting in a revision surgery. So in that context, we took hip implants as an example, and we um, examined the performance of the same uh, medical device, so the same hip implants, um, across nine registries. As mentioned before, ODAP assigns orthopedic implants a rating based on the maximum revision risk at several points in time. And you see here the three, the five, and the 10-year risk. And this rating 
is assigned based on evidence that is supplied to them by the manufacturer, which can be a trial or a single registry. But we examined whether this rating would also be assigned uh, when taking the collective evidence of all the data from nine registries into account. And all of these registries had high completeness. And here you see the results of the highest rated cups, the A-star cups, um, where the red line indicates the thresholds that ODEP would give uh, before assigning such an A-star rating. And to get such a rating, the entire confidence interval around that revision risk should be on the left side of that red line. So the results indicate that only about 30 to 40 percent of the highest rated A star, both cups and stems, would receive such a rating, the highest rating based on the pooled uh, revision risk across all these nine registries. So this indicates variable performance across registries. And in some cases, uh, some of these implants would only get the A star rating in one or two registries, but not in the other registries. Then looking at other types of data sources, we took knee implants as an example. Uh, using the Core MD tool, uh, we identified safety notices as published on the websites of 13 national competent authorities. Um, and we looked at registries websites on what they published publicly. So it's publicly available information on implants they have identified as having a significantly higher revision risk. And as you see on this slide, there is overlap of both sources signaling uh, the same uh, implant. Um, but safety notices also point to different implants. It could be that it has not yet um, influenced the revision risk, so that it is an early signal, but it could also be that the safety notice, in, in fact, um, influences another endpoint, so not revision. I should also know that what we found is that very often the safety, the information provided in the safety notice was not very detailed. So besides the brand name, we were not sure whether it was the cemented version or the uncemented version. So potentially there may be some added value in combining these data sources, but there are also challenges. So with the knowledge that we obtained from all of these uh, studies, Together with a Delphi study um, among uh, more than 50 international experts, um, we uh, let that inform uh, a decision framework that regulators might use when assessing the evidence from registries and potentially also other real world data. And we used the guiding principles that you saw before, relevance and reliability. And um, within those, um, defined four different domains uh, and with items that were defined clearly within each of these domains. So for instance, data, the data needs to be suitable to answer a particular regulatory question. And within that, uh, things like a representative uh, population, what are the patient inclusion and exclusion criteria would be important items to assess. Within the data quality domain, the completeness of procedures would be important. And when it comes to data analysis, a minimum number of patients at risk, for instance, uh, that would be required for meaningful analysis. So uh, since not all re registries can do, probably can do well on all of these items, which might be very difficult, um, we felt that also the average rank that our experts have provided uh, in terms of the importance of each of these items could help regulators to guide them in what item was particularly important. So to conclude, to answer my initial question, we think that registry data can supplement the evidence from RCT uh, to assess safety and performance, provided good quality data and the use of appropriate analysis. And in the QuantD project, we've uh, conducted some initial steps uh, in terms of the, the items that could be reported. Uh, but of course, further steps can be taken to define what then is exactly sufficient quality, as we've done with the example for ODAP. 
We could also work further to harmonize data outcome sets to make these federated network analysis or combined analysis across registries easier. And finally, combining different data sources, different types of data may provide more insight. And we've just given one example, but we can imagine that other data types like electronic health records or, uh, or uh, medical charts might also uh, be helpful, but should be explored further. And to really stress the importance of quality of data, um, real world data can also be used potentially to streamline trials, to make it easier to conduct trials. But even then, uh, good quality data will be of paramount importance, as well as the use of common definitions uh, that can be used within the regulatory context. Thank you. And thank you, Perla. That was a, a great overview, and it's great to hear about this research activity, which is bringing the registry world and the regulatory world, hopefully, a little closer together in Europe. Um, maybe if we have time for just one question, um, Daniel Giraud uh, read, raised the question in the chat part. Um, I'll just read it out briefly, um, just so you can hear it. Um, she notes, for registries to issue a rating for particular implants is just one part of the problem. And another part is the surgical procedure and the skills required from one surgeon to another. So total transparency is required and it's not solely implant based. And I guess this would include the revision rate, which is not just related to the implant, but also the surgical technique and the environment. Um, so I guess thinking not just about the product, but I guess the, the context of its use um, yeah, I guess yeah, um, uh, absolutely. So we we take this as purely highlighting uh, that there are other factors involved. So the variable performance, to me at least, uh, points to that it's not just the implant, but but like the surgeon, uh, potentially also the health system, as there's also evidence that the revision risks tend to be lower uh, in certain countries or certain registries, which also could point to a different indication to revise, for instance, uh, but it may have consequences if uh, other countries would just use the ratings um, supplied in one country uh, at face value without looking at their own data first. So I think that would be the point I would make. Yeah, it, it can be health system related. And, and as Rob noted with that JAMA article that showed private and public different yes. outcomes. But yeah. Um, so it, it's a complicated world and we do need that tapestry of evidence, I suppose, um, rather than complete reliance on a single source. Um, if it's OK, I might move to our last presentation and then we'll hopefully still have time for a couple of questions and answers um, afterwards. Uh, so our next speaker is Dr. Joshua Bridgens, who's a medical de director with Dupuy Synthes. Uh, Josh is going to present a manufacturer's perspective on the needs and challenges pertaining to registry data. So um, thank you, Josh. I'll hand over to you. Thanks very much, Tom. Can you see and hear that OK? Yes. Perfect. OK, so um, I'm an ex-orthopaedic surgeon from the UK. I now work for Depew Synthes, which is an orthopaedic manufacturer. And I've been asked to talk uh, from a manufacturer's perspective about the needs and challenges which we see in relation to registry data. I'm not going to go over again the, uh, you know, the benefits really of registry data. I think that's been well covered and particularly Richard uh, talking about the lifetime requirement is a reason why registries uh, are so vital for us really as manufacturers. But in terms of what we need from registries, the first absolutely vital thing is we need registries to exist. They need, they need to be out there. I work in the orthopedic uh, part of the uh, medical device world, and we're incredibly fortunate because we do have globally many uh, national joint registries. And these are registries which collect every usage of hip and knee implants within certain countries. But those types of registries don't exist for all medical devices, all medical implants. And really because of the requirements which we now have from the MDR, manufacturers have a need for registries to exist across the whole breadth of medical implants. So that's the first thing which is really vital for us. But the second part is those registries then need to be sustainable. And this is where it can sound a bit boring, but 
we have to really uh, know what the governance arrangements and the financial sustainability of those registries are. And the reason that's so important for us is because when we go to our regulators, to the notified bodies, we need to be able to give them an assurance that we are going to be able to continue collecting this data through the lifetime. What can we reasonably base a belief on that we will be able to get that data in 10, 20 and 30 years from now? And that's why the sustainability of these registries and the ability to provide evidence around that is so vital to us. The second point is a really, it sounds very basic, but it's absolutely vital to us. And that, that these registries must collect data at the implant level, and in fact, the product code level. So every small different variant within a brand, we need to have that identified within the registry. Now, with orthopedic joint replacement registries, again, we're very fortunate because that was really the way in which they were pretty much always set up from the start. And that's because they were from the start driven by a philosophy, which was to look at the performance of the implants. And that was probably driven because there were a number of prominent examples in orthopedics where there had been problems with performance of implants. And so that drove surgeons to look at that particular area. But to the discussion we were just having, they weren't particularly thinking so much about the effect maybe of the surgeon or the approach um, or even the institution on performance. Registries in other surgical areas were actually set up with quite a different focus. And often it was to look at the performance of a particular procedure. So for example, in the vascular world, you may have had registries set up which were looking at the difference between a surgical carotid endarterectomy compared with a carotid artery stenting. And there was a implicit, and often even unwritten assumption within that, that all of the stents were equivalent and would perform the same. And you were just looking at the difference between the two fundamental procedures. And so many registries may just have noted whether a device was used or maybe would have just collected the brand name of the device in a free text box. And neither of those kind of approaches now gives us the level of data which we require. So certainly nowadays, that's an absolutely vital aspect that it has to be collecting product code level uh, data. We've already heard quite a lot of discussion around data quality, and that is, again, an absolute requirement for manufacturers because we need to be able to justify the high level of that data quality. And we could talk about that for an hour, and there's lots of discussions about how registries measure that. But I think the fundamentals are that you should be collecting data for an entire population, ideally. It shouldn't be a subset of a population. And the capture of that population in terms of any subsequent events must be extremely high. There are then other facets of data collection that um, should be assured as well. There are inevitable errors when data is put into registries, um, and there has to be some way that that's audited and um, improved over time. And again, we've heard quite a lot already about how it's vital that outcomes have to be collected. And similar to uh, what Richard was saying at the start, they have to cover both the safety and the performance of the device. And the slight problem is that these things aren't uh, defined clearly, safety and performance. Uh, I would suggest that the definition of safety is the avoidance of outcomes, which you're not intending. So what surgeons would often think of as being the complications of surgery, Whereas the performance is the demonstration that the device is doing that which is it is intended to do. So to give an example from total hip replacement, you're intending that this device is going to relieve the pain the patient is in, and to some extent at least restore their mobility. That's definitely the performance. A lot of registries focus on the surgical event. So they're good at picking up repeat surgical events, and those are often related to safety. So if you've had, for, to continue with the hip example, a fracture of that femoral stem, the patient will almost inevitably have to come back to surgery. So you will pick up that safety event. 
But I would also suggest that you can make conclusions about performance from any repeat surgical event as well. It's clear that if the device has to be removed, it has to be revised because it's broken. At that point, its performance has also stopped, has also failed. And you can draw that uh, inference. But equally, all the patients who have not returned to surgery and are still out there having not having to go down that route, I think a conclusion can also be drawn about the continuing performance of the device in those patients. Particularly if you also have information that may be five or 10 years, giving more detail about that performance. I think in the very long term, the absence of any safety outcomes, the absence of any repeat surgery can be used as a, as a marker for that ongoing performance. Manufacturers also need a means of getting data from registries. Um, that sounds obvious, but actually in the past, it was often the case that manufacturers didn't have access to data from registries. Um, that has improved significantly over the last five to 10 years. It should ideally be easy to get that data. It should be supplied regularly. It's probably, you know, if it only comes out every two years, for example, that isn't regularly enough for our needs. And it needs to be detailed and comprehensive. So those are some of the practical needs that manufacturers have from registries. What are the challenges which we face? Well, a lot of them are just the inverse of those needs. So the biggest challenge is that relevant registry simply may not exist. If the data hasn't been gathered at that product code level, we're not able to uh, make effective use of the data within a registry. Outcomes may be entirely absent or they don't fully cover both safety and performance, as we've heard is uh, necessary. Or the data quality may not be high enough to be reliable. Or as manufacturers, we simply aren't able to get access to the data, even if it does exist and it is of high quality. There has historically been another challenge, which has been regulator acceptance of uh, data from registries. I'm pleased to say that there has been very rapid and very positive change in this over the last five years or so. Five years ago, I think we were still involved in discussions with some regulators about whether registry data was valid at all. And now we've moved to a position today where Richard was referring to registry data as actually being a, a specific method of PMCF. So not even now seen as being passive data, uh, which is coming to manufacturers, but being a, you know, a specific method that we can use to follow uh, implants over time. And that is a very welcome and very positive change. I think there has been a mindset probably derived from the pharmaceutical industry that randomized controlled trials are the gold standard and that anything else is somehow inferior to those. I think for medical devices, registry is actually arguably the best data set we have available to us, particularly over that uh, long term lifetime of an implant. And, you know, I would challenge slightly what um, Richard was saying at the start about the bias in registries. I think if you have a very good registry, a national registry covering all implantations with excellent capture of any further events, you've arguably reduced the bias by making sure that every patient, every surgeon, every center, every implant is being captured. Where I would agree that bias could exist is then how you analyze and present that data afterwards. And that's why increasingly we're seeing registries doing their own analysis of the data and presenting a certain set analyses to manufacturers to avoid that sort of secondary risk of bias, which again, I think is a positive thing. So finally, as the regulatory environment has evolved over the last uh, five to 10 years, the requirements have changed. And the biggest challenge I think manufacturers overall now face is that orthopedic registry levels of data are being expected on all medical devices. The problem here is that many of those devices are seen by surgeons as being just generic or utility. 
devices. They're not seen as being something where there is a need to collect data or do research or whether there, where there is an interest in doing it. And so what we don't have is a driving force from surgeon users to establish registries in those areas. And I can tell you from personal experience that it's very difficult for manufacturers to drive the establishment of registries that will have complete the necessary complete buy-in from the clinical community. So I think probably for those types of devices, the only way in which orthopedic star registries will be able to be set up is actually for the drive to come from governments um, on a national level. And we're certainly seeing uh, things going in that direction, particularly in countries like the UK at the moment. And again, for manufacturers, those are very positive uh, changes in meeting the challenges we face. So thank you very much, Tom. Um, thank you, Josh. And it was great to hear that, uh, I guess, manufacturer perspective and also your, your background as an orthopedic surgeon. Um, maybe just to open the questions and answers part, um, we have a, a question from Alan Fraser that uh, Rob uh, provided a response for uh, in the comment part. Um, but maybe if I could raise it for you first, Josh, and we could open it out then. Um, so what Alan mentions is that collectively, you've made an excellent and convincing case for device registries, but how do we recommend that they can be made sustainable and whose responsibility should it be? And especially, I guess, the funding question. I guess, Josh, you just mentioned already that there are some moves to have publicly funded registry sources. And as you very rightly mentioned, there are some areas um, where you know the clinical community rallying to drive registry platforms is probably not so present, but it would be great to hear how do we maybe for the orthopedic world, we have established registries, but thinking of how do we take that orthopedic registry experience and try to introduce it where it will be most helpful for regulatory purposes. What would be your perspective? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think we have a good model in uh, quite a few national orthopedic registries now where it's been demonstrated that they can be run sustainably um, and on a sound economic footing. And I think some of that needs to come from a sort of national governmental level, because clearly the protection uh, and improvement in the health of the population of those countries is, is very valuable and worth investing in for the governments of those countries. But I think given the you know extensive use now that manufacturers make of this data, not just for regulatory purposes, but also in R&D, improvement of our devices i think it's reasonable that manufacturers also um, make a a not insignificant contribution to the running of those registries and that's certainly the way in which it has worked in orthopedics so I, I suppose my suggestion would be that we should take some of those sustainable models that already exist and try and you know don't try and re reinvent the wheel just to, to try and use those for the other registries that now need to be established um, thank you, Josh. I, I might open it to the floor if anyone has any other perspectives on that topic. How do we make registries sustainable more broadly? Uh, does anyone want to come in? Well, no, what I answered in, in, in the, in the Q&A, of course, of course, I think uh, the DRGs for hips and knees in the Netherlands is, is around six to 7,000 euros. And we spend 20 euros on registries and only the hips and knees are funded. While the, the wrist, the finger, the, the shoulder, which are only three and a half thousand, three hundred elbows, are just funded by this DRG of the hips and knees. So the same can be true, also be done for the cardiovascular. Take the bulk, and then the, 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 the smaller the number of devices, like orphan devices, can be funded through that thing. And so I think, and that's up to insurance. So I think in, in the former century, I also talked to the industry a long time ago in, in the 90s. To that they would funding uh, fund the the all the bigger registries. We're talking about ten guilders. That's about four euros. That, that didn't work. These four euros on the implant of, of two thousand guilders. But the fact we have now the private insurance governing board decides this. That's that's a way forward. And looking at the cost reduction is huge. I mean, after seven thousand euros, twenty euros. That that's that's nothing. And then you do about eighty thousand hips and knees a year. That's one point six million. Oh, I think that's the simple answer. I think it's also the community and, and the medical specialists they should talk to government, the, the governing agencies. You may do it through the, uh, the, the 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 government, like in the UK. Well, in the Netherlands, we do it on on a, on a voluntary basis, and we have ninety nine percent completeness on the primary inclusion, 
and 98% on the revision. So it is possible. But the main question is, what's in it for me? And for me as a clinician, what's in it for me is, how is my performance? And for the government, it may be blame and shame, well, to put it very negatively, but that's not, not the goal forward. It's, that's, at least that's my experience. Uh, since I'm the founder of the Dutch Arthroplasty, it's, uh, well, we have now more than 1.1 million implants in. Thank you, Rob. And you know, I think that perspective, having practically done this, is very valuable. But I think your point about having a national policy and thinking about who the registry truly delivers for. Yeah. We know ultimately it delivers for patient care, but along that journey, there are important things for you know surgeon performance. And I know that with the National Joint Registry in the UK, if you're an outlier from greater than two quarters, that triggers yeah. certain further assessments that are benefits for health systems, for manufacturers, you know, for surgeons, or at least for the surgeon, surgeon clinical associations or uh, governance yeah. bodies. So I guess it, probably the first point is getting that national policy together and then seeing how um, how that kind of works its way through. But um, that simple approach from the Netherlands of having a cost per implant seems like a very nice policy approach. Um, yeah. No, but that's not, not cost per implant, it's the whole DRG. So admittance in a hospital, for two days for total hip. So the whole th thing. So the DRG is implants are only 1,000 euros. But it goes hospital admittance, uh, tests, et cetera, et cetera. That's around, well, depends on which clinic. It's between five, six, seven thousand 7,000 euros. So that's nothing. The implants are only thousands. So it's not the manufacturer, but the private insurance governing board. And that we have private insurance. And that board gives out of the DRG 20 euros. Very good. Um, I, I might take that there is a, a question from the chat. I, I think it's relevant, maybe Rich, for myself and yourself, um, maybe just to run through it. And then I, I can see one more question in the chat. We might have time for just uh, one more question afterwards. Um, but the question is, is it possible to use clinician feedback or evaluation for legacy medical devices from post-market surveillance data without performing post-market clinical follow-up when there is no long-term open safety-related risks to the medical device? Or does it have to be from post-market clinical follow-up? So I think the question here is getting at, I guess, legacy devices and wondering about whether you need to proactively go and ask clinicians about their experience in using the device. I guess this may be linked to the MDCG 2020-6 in the hierarchy, where if you go to Appendix 3 there, there are two types of survey engagement and questionnaires mentioned as a level four and a level eight. I'll maybe leave it for people to read the guidance and, and look it up there. But I guess maybe, Rich, it will be great to hear your perspective, uh, having seen lots of conformity assessments for medical devices and for legacy devices coming through. In a case like that, where there aren't open safety issues, as the person mentions, uh, would you expect a proactive post-market clinical follow-up or would a justification be sufficient? Yeah, thanks, Tom. I think surveys is quite interesting. You know, we've seen so many surveys being presented to notifying bodies uh, as ways of of trying to be sufficient clinical data. As you say, this high quality versus low quality. So, I think you know it's all about the question you're trying to plug or the gap in in terms of your data sets. And I think you know, yes, saying something doesn't have safety concerns doesn't necessarily mean that there aren't safety concerns. It's just you know, it, have have they been proactive in identifying them? So, what we tend to see as notifying bodies high quality surveys can be physician focused and they might be sort of uh, focused on on a data set of, of maybe 100 devices used that they might go and do some retrospective data analysis on uh, and actually get some patient reported outcome measures versus low quality surveys which to us are tend to be more usability surveys for things like surgical instruments and things like that where we want to make sure that the phys physician is using them appropriately so i think we have to be very careful some of this some of these areas where there is a um, uh, sort of usability issues they can be picked up through sort of usability set testing not necessarily surveys themselves in regards to the point around post-market clinical follow-up the expectation really under the under the regulation talks when we talk even about general methods it says screening of scientific literature and feedback from users and is there ever ever a chance that a manufacturer is going to refuse feedback from users and so that that kind of ties in with that so i think there's always an expectation that manufacturers have to be proactive now under the regulation of getting feedback from users and doing something with it um not just waiting for the phone to call and, and you know i'm sure rob will talk to this but you know as a physician you, you know you're you're so busy with your clinical data Today, when when things are small problems, 
and smaller issues, you don't you typically report them because you, you're thinking about the next patient and the next case that, that needs to be on the table and being chased by hospital managers to, to be more efficient. So, so the reality is that, that in these situations, you know, that's where we're expecting manufacturers maybe to go a little bit above and beyond and, and use, particularly in legacy devices, have those surveys with physicians to try and bring in some, some additional data that, that can help support the device's safety and performance. If I may respond to this, I think the good initiative is in the UK with the Beyond Compliance Initiative. So surgeons and not the inventors, they talk and they, they, they collect data in a more rigorous way. I think that's, that's, I think also analyzing outliers, at least in the Netherlands, we made it that way, that also surgeons are involved. Because all you know, you can also interpret data in a wrong way. So it's how to massage, how to live statistics, I would put it. So that's the danger when you only have methodologists, epidemiologists, but all due respect, it has to be both ways, people who understand data, so clinical scientists, as well as methodologists, have to be involved just to prevent garbage interpretation of garbage. Yeah. But to put it very bluntly, I think. But you know yeah. what I mean. And um, well, um, I think that so beyond compliance, I think it's a way forward as well for a new innovative device to have this feedback and not recall bias. That's the danger. Yeah. So that that's very yeah, recall bias is a big thing that we we often see. I think I think to pick up on one of Rob's points as well is around sort of in the UK we had a, a a drive to have cardiothoracic surgeons data publicly available, and that actually you know we thought that was going to be a transparent way of doing things, but actually it backflipped because suddenly you know the good surgeons who were taking on the complex cases yeah. <laughs> it was suddenly being thought of as as dangerous or. But and then they start to say, well, my private practice is actually getting impacted down the road because people yeah. think I'm a bad surgeon. But what it is, I'm willing to take that risk and and take on those complex cases. So we always have to be very mindful. And having physicians involved in in that data analysis from registries is is critically important to be able to to give the the logical and pragmatic reasons that are often behind certain types of devices, etc. And that can come out through surveys with physicians as well. And thank you, Rich uh, and Rob. I, I guess we're, we're gone a little over time, but I might just take one more question, um, if that's okay. Um, and I guess, Perla, this one might be relevant uh, to you, I guess, given some of the Delphi activity um, that you've been uh, engaged in recently. Um, so Garod McGoran um, from HPRA uh, raised a question, uh, noting about registries. In order to be complete, a registry has to be truly vast if it's going to meet the demands of all the stakeholders and would need to be developed through multi-stakeholder collaboration. Um, and can often need to address the needs of clinicians, patients, researchers, industry, health institutions, public health bodies, health technology assessment bodies, notified bodies and regulators. So registries can have uh, quite a lot of people interested in their outcomes. So I guess the, the question that Garod mentions is, how achievable is it that a registry can meet all of these needs whilst being sustainable and user-friendly? Uh, it would be great to hear your perspective, Perla, having recently worked on that Delphi, which is trying to tease out what are the key questions for regulators, at least, um, and trying to understand, you know, what could, sort of common minimal data sets might look like? Um, perhaps I could turn to you. Yes, thank you, Tom. Well, it, it is um, uh, a question with multiple perspectives, so I'll, I'll do my best to, to answer at least some of these. Uh, I do think that um, in, in that systematic review that we did, we also queried the uh, the registries in what they reported on the initial motivation. So why did they set up the registry? And that was already quite revealing uh, as it was often uh, motivated by improving the quality of care, safety, but sometimes also educational purposes, trying to understand more about the disease severity, the natural cause of disease. Um, so as Josh said, for instance, in orthopedics, we have quite a good tradition already in registries, uh, and they have been set up in a certain way. Um, in general, I think it will not be possible to meet maybe the demands of every of these stakeholders, but I think what we could try and do is, given that the information that we have, um, to make it at least more widely known what you can do and perhaps cannot do. You cannot simply collect all the data that would be relevant potentially. Uh, so you need also some focus. So that's why I felt this Delphi process potentially uh, was very interesting where we focused of course on the methods uh, side, uh, both for the analysis and for the quality of data in terms of what do you really need 
to consider whether it's good quality evidence, whether this is a suitable analysis. And for that, I think the input for all of these stakeholders was very valuable because they all considered what would I need from my perspective. Uh, so I think in, in that sense, we achieved a fairly good um, minimum data set. Um, we also fo really focused on the minimum part uh, because otherwise it would be unachievable and unfeasible again. Uh, but again, I think this question also shows that working, trying to work towards harmonization of a common outcome set that potentially could be used for multiple purposes uh, could be a very interesting and worthwhile exercise trying to get agreement on that. What are the data that the different stakeholders need? And I don't think that we are really there yet but it could be uh, really worthwhile to make the um, MDR work as intended, so to say. Um, thank you, Perla. Um, but unless anyone would like to jump in with any burning final comments, um, I'm conscious that we're gone a little bit over time, and I know that there's a couple more um, questions in the chat bar. Uh, we can figure out how to respond, maybe by writing back some, some written comments um, for those people we didn't manage to address. Um, from my perspective, I'd just like to say thank you to all the panelists um, and thank you to everyone um, who's engaged through the chat bar. Um, I think we're able to deal with uh, most of the questions uh, apart from one or two who, that arrived just recently. Um, just to note, uh, you'll be able to rewatch this webinar. It'll be on the Core MD webpage. Um, so you'll be able to find that as well as all the links to the upcoming webinars and that final meeting. Um, so I guess from my side, I'd just like to say thank you to everyone um, and all the best. <laughs>